Welcome to First. I'm Shirley Min along with Michelle Polston and Mark Eichmann. The downtown district of Wilmington has been getting a facelift over the last four years. Is it enough to convince new and younger residents to move in and stay there? The Blood Bank of Delmarva is trying to convince you to be the next donor as the need for blood always increases during the holiday season. How about treating yourself after that trip to the blood bank? The specialty supermarket biz is booming. We have our exotic tastes and some clever marketing tricks to blame. First, your public media news magazine starts now. Tuesday, Wilmington Downtown Visions is holding a meet and greet with Mayor-elect Mike Perzicki. It's a chance for the incoming mayor to connect with the city he will govern for the next four years. The Wilmington that Perzicki will walk into is different. There are new restaurants, bars, and lots of apartments. The housing and new amenities are part of a citywide effort to bring young people to Wilmington. Here's our first look. This is where Wilmington's newest apartment building is going up. 200 luxury spaces in the city's Midtown neighborhood. I don't think we could have projected that we would have so many new residents, uh, so many upwardly mobile residents live in our buildings in this short of a time. The Buccini Poland Group is the Wilmington developer behind this new construction and several other apartments and condos in Wilmington. They've opened floor plans, stainless steel appliances and granite countertops. Senior VP Michael Hare says since 2001, BPG has developed close to 1,400 residential units at the riverfront, on Market Street in Wilmington's Central Business District, and places in between. Hare says 95 percent of them are occupied. It tells us that as employment continues to grow uh, in the city, in and around Wilmington, the demand for housing grows in and around Wilmington. Among BPG's renters, Hare says, 35% are millennials, typically considered 34 and younger, without kids. Young professionals, or YPs, a highly sought-after demographic in Wilmington, not only for their spending power, but also because of the vibrancy they bring. Initially, our focus was how can we build a residential downtown living base. And that's something that uh, we've been focused on for, for 10 years now. And that's occurred. In the past four or five years with this national focus, the proliferation of the word millennials and the focus on, on, on young professionals that we've also sort of just rolled that in to what we want to accomplish. Our goal is to, to keep them here. We want them to live here. We want them to eat here. We want them to go to the bars and go to the theaters and, and really just see that Wilmington has a lot to offer. But Todd Miller says Wilmington can be a tough sell for prospective employees. The number one thing that we hear is, oh, you're in Delaware. Uh, where is that? Miller is the chief experience officer at the Archer Group, an agency that helps companies get the most out of anything digital. We're talking websites, social media, and mobile apps. It's a young industry. It's, it's an industry that hasn't been around for a long time. It's an industry that I think attracts people that are more natively using um, the tools every single day. Yep, millennials. The average age of Archer's 74 employees, 28. And the tech industry is cutthroat. We hear, you know, across the industry that it's a 14 to 18 month tenure, depending on the kind of type of agency you are, your location, things like that. So you really have to differentiate yourself and know what you stand for. And for us, we want to show that we want to invest in our employees. The workspace exudes cool. Look, foosball. All to create this laid back, fun work environment. But Miller admits Wilmington is seen as a drawback at first when it comes to recruiting top new talent, which is why he tries to get them to the office ASAP. Once you get here and you understand it's not far from Center City, Philadelphia or from the Burbs, once you get a sense that there's a little bit more of a community that's building up around us right now, then it isn't as hard of a sell. As it is, the vast majority of his employees live in Philly or the PA suburbs. But he says Wilmington has changed a lot and for the better in the 10 years he's been with Archer. Now there's beer gardens popping up, there's farmers markets that are popping up, there's different events that are coming in. So the win for us is I want more people to say, wow, maybe I want to live in Wilmington. I want to live closer. Deputy Chief of Staff Sam Lukoff says Wilmington has a healthy YP population when it comes to working here. But come 5 o'clock, see you, Wilmington. 
Lukoff helped spearhead the mayor's Young Professionals Task Force, where she heard from about two dozen YPs about the city's pros and cons. A plus? You can be a big fish in a small pond. In Wilmington, they were able to make a name for themselves very quickly. They were, you know, moving and shaking with the top leaders. One of the not so great things is that they said there wasn't a ton to do here nightlife wise. Which is why Lukov helped organize what the city called YP Week earlier this year to show off Wilmington's fun side. On this day, it was a lunchtime dance party at the Queen. There's always this discussion about the chicken or the egg. How do you get new residents downtown without the services, um, but you, you need the spending power of residents in a downtown area to support the services. We think we're in probably the fifth or sixth inning here in the city of Wilmington uh, in terms of our residential and retail development. We've got so many great restaurants that have opened, many more that are going to come in the next 12 months. So uh, we think we're past the hard part for sure. Rent for a one bedroom in one of BPG's apartments ranges from $550 to $1150 a month, but the luxury units being built now will go for more. Now, unfortunately, the city still has this murder town cloud hanging over it, but Economic Development Director Jeff Flynn believes as more people move downtown that that will deter crime. So the irony here, Shirley, is that much of this started under outgoing Mayor Dennis Williams' watch. Uh, he'll probably bring this up during his farewell address next week. Yeah, he probably will. You know, young people are a big component to the success of the city. Now, we also should remember that improvements made under former Mayor Jim Baker, they finally took hold in the Williams administration, so we could see this carry on under Przicki's time in office. But the key to remember in all of this is that almost half of the city's revenues are generated by wage tax from people who live here or work here, so more people downtown is good for the city. Okay, well, thanks, Shirley. Uh, you can follow the transition and administration on newsworks.org slash Delaware. Coming up, first takes you grocery shopping. For some, it's more than just buying a few quick things for dinner. Some supermarkets make the whole event an experience. And speaking of experiences, check out the craftsmanship performed by Jeffrey Todd Moore. You'll be glad you waited and watched. The year is quickly coming to a close, and in case you haven't started your Christmas shopping, you may want to get on that. As you walk through the malls or along Main Street, we have something for you to think about it. We're going to talk about it during State of Play time here with Stephanie Hansen of the law firm of Young, Conaway, Stargett, and Taylor. Also joining us, Michael Stafford. He's an attorney and columnist and occasional MSNBC contributor. Uh, so I know we like to keep the topics about Delaware here on State of Play, but obviously uh, this is our first State of Play with you guys since... Uh, the President-elect Trump was uh, elected. So what do you think the impact uh, his election will have here in Delaware? Are there specific things he brings to the White House that will have specific impact in the first state? Well, yeah, well, I, 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 I tend to think so. I mean, education policy, environmental policy, there's a, there's a range of, of specific issues that impact state funding and, and, and what we're doing in our public schools and, and with respect to the environment. More broadly, I mean, my, my question is whether just as we saw the Tea Party, sort of that right populist expression, uh, insurgency, uh, in rising immediately after Obama's election in 2008, I wonder if uh, a Trump administration is going to trigger something on the sort of the progressive populist side from the left, a, a, a Jack, Jacobin, I mean, I'm not sure what it would be, call itself or what it would look like, but I wonder if we're going to see almost a mere image movement on the left. Yeah, I think, I think that it really, I guess, kind of legitimizes, I guess is the word, the the republic, the rural Republican folks in Kent and Sussex County in particular that have felt marginalized. And so um, I think really what we'll have now in Delaware is really more two distinct Republican camps. We've got the Republican camp that is like the, the former Tea Party, you know, folks in Kent and Sussex, and then we've got the sort of the Greenville Republicans. Right. And it's going to be the challenge of the Republican Party here in Delaware to bring those two groups together enough to start now you know, winning yeah. some of the elections that they want to win. But they do seem energized. I think the flip side of that is it shocked the Democrats. It did. So maybe the Democrats that had been a little more complacent about, oh, Democrat, Delaware is just a Democratic state, we don't have anything to worry about, will be a little more energized themselves. I think the Democratic Party, though, I mean, we, we look at it as a national issue. It is a fatal mistake to let the Republicans capture the anti-establishment label. I mean, th there needs to be a democratic alternative. And you, you look at like Bernie Sanders, um, a few other people, Elizabeth Warren, 
but th there needs to be a left populist alternative that challenges, you know, neoliberalism that looks at like the Washington consensus on economic and task tax and fiscal policy, military interventionism abroad. There's a real political space for that. Uh, so, th so then back here specifically to to what happened uh, on election night, uh, we, we have sort of an inter interesting hypothetical now set up because of what happened in Delaware on election night. Uh, Steve Tanzer, Delaware liberal, was here uh, not too long ago, and he came up with an interesting scenario right after the election. The state Senate now sits uh, 11 to 10 in favor of the Democrats. Uh, Senator Bethany Hall Long is now Lieutenant Governor elect. Hall long and will be moving out. So there will be a special election. So we're sort of in a position where, for the first time in quite a long time, we could see the state Senate flip. You worked on Bethany Hall Long's campaign in some capacity. Do you, do you see that as a, as a concern for Democrats that it's the a Senate huge, could be in, in jeopardy? It is, a, it is a huge concern for Democrats, yes. Because right now, um, with, with Bethany you know, out of the picture, it's 10 to 10. So whoever takes that Senate seat, um, that party will then have the majority in the Senate. And that, that is a huge concern for Democrats. And taking a look at the district, I think it's the Democrats to lose mm -hmm. because it is, it's more heavily Democrat than Republicans. But Republicans are energized, as we, have, as we just talked about. Right. Um, and they tend to do better than Democrats in a special election. They tend to turn out more of their people than the Democrats do. So this is going to be a very interesting race. Yeah, the Republicans have a good track record of winning special elections here in Delaware. I don't know if there's any magic pixie dust to that. Um, the district, as you said, is it definitely leans Democrat, particularly the new parts south of the canal. John Marino ran a good race against Bethany the last time she was up for election. Um, came closer than I thought he was going to, but again, there was the issue with the yard signs and her husband right before the election. Does he come as close without that kind of publicity? I'm not so sure. So, so were that to happen and, and the Senate flips and becomes, so then we have sort of the split, uh, split party in governance in Delaware, what does that mean for Governor-elect John Carney as he p plans his transition into moving into Woodburn and taking over? What does that mean for him were he to have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate? Well, I think he'll have to be more cognizant about making sure that the folks in Kent and Sussex County are brought into the fold mm -hmm. and in the decision-making process, and a lot of and that their concerns are heard, which I think that he would do anyway. To be honest, I mean, John is really Delaware's home hometown guy. You know, he's a Claymont guy. He's the kind of guy that you you go to a football game with and have a hot dog with. Right. He's like Delaware's Bruce Springsteen. So I don't think that he will have trouble with that, whether it goes Democrat or Republican, but it would certainly make things more difficult for him if it's Republican. Yeah, I mean, part of it's going to be, his level of difficulty is going to be contingent on the amount of internal cohesion that the caucus, the Republican State Senate caucus is able to maintain. If I were John, I would be looking at opportunities to target and peel off some of the Newcastle County Republicans, not necessarily Greg Lavelle, but maybe like Kathy, uh, Kathy Cloutier, um, on issues where there's a gap between what their districts want and support and what some of the more fire-breathing uh, conservative types from uh, Sussex County or from Kent County are willing to support. And then finally, real quick, as he uh, moves out of the uh, of the governor's office after eight years, uh, career advice for, for, for Jack Markell? You see him popping back up again uh, on a ballot somewhere or uh, back in business? What do, what do you think, uh, quick 10 seconds here? I don't see him running for something again. I, I don't get that mm -hmm. feeling, but certainly in a position, either an appointed position in Washington or maybe even something, you know, head of the University of Delaware. He's landing on his feet after the governor's office. Yeah. Which one among this crew doesn't? <laughs> All right, uh, we'll leave it there. Stephanie Hansen and Mike Stafford, thanks so much for being here uh, and have a great holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Did you just tune in? Go click on whyy.org slash first to watch the beginning of the program. Past shows are there as well. While you are online, go sign up for our newsletter so you can learn more about WHYY in Delaware. The supermarket landscape in Delaware is changing. In the November issue, our content partner at Delaware Today magazine reported on upscale and specialty grocery stores, which are growing in popularity. The Newark Natural Food Co-op is one of those specialty stores, which has been serving up organic and farm fresh foods long before it became a trend.
The Newark Natural Food Co-op is a far cry from its humble beginnings. The co-op was started in 1967 as a buyer's club. The goal was simple. They wanted to provide their families with wholesome, clean foods. So the Newark, Delaware area is surrounded by many, many farms, uh, a lot of agribusiness work, and it made sense that we had all these local farms. Today, that dream of providing locally produced farm foods and much more has grown from a small one-story building to a 10,000 square foot facility with an adjacent cafe in the Newark Shopping Center. We'll come up, do our shopping, and then we love to go to the cafe, and we know that we're getting good, quality, healthy food. Customers say they prefer the healthier choices. The variety of products here are very different than a commercial grocery store. Um, they have many less processed items, so you can get things similar, but they're much less processed, much many you know less processed ingredients. And customers aren't just shoppers. Because it's a co-op, they can become part owners of the store by becoming members. We're not a corporation as in we have one owner or a couple owners. Uh, we are guided by a board of stewards, which uh, they are voted in by our members. So members have a say in every aspect of the store. Redwine Haddad is a member and vendor, and he enjoys the autonomy of being self-governed. They give me the freedom because they trust me. I have good relationship with people. People love my brother. And we work in really great harmony. And they are very supportive for everything, serve the majority. But you don't have to be a member to shop here. When I walked in, I, didn't, I never got the feeling that you had to be a member here to shop here. Everyone was so welcoming and so friendly that no matter if you're a member or non-member, you've been shopping there for 20 years, this is your first time in, everyone made you feel welcome and part of a family. But membership does have its privileges. Other than the fact that this is a democracy and you, you actually own a piece of the co-op. Um, you get automatic daily discounts. So the price is on the shelves. You don't pay full price. Um, every quarter you uh, get a larger discount. Membership is also a good way to get involved. I learned about other opportunities where I could volunteer and help out. And so I was on the um, New York Natural Foods um, relocation committee and that allowed me to be on the committee that made decisions about this move, about this bill. Joining us now is Delaware Today Magazine writer Pam George. Pam, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. You wrote in your article that brand loyalty is sort of this thing of the past. What's going on there? Well, I think that people have uh, a lot of things they like at certain stores. Mm -hmm. So at Costco, you can get bulk items. Mm -hmm. um, people are also shopping for price. Whole Foods, they can meet their dietary restrictions, their dietary needs. Wegmans, people just love Wegmans no matter what. Yeah. It's just <laughs> the idea of Wegmans and the fact that it is come to this area, which is one reason why I wrote the story. The excitement on Facebook when Wegmans opened was, was intense. <laughs> <laughs> so people don't mind making multiple trips to all these different stores, even though it takes more time. Evidently not, and, and when summer comes, they'll go to the farmer's market, mm -hmm. they'll go to Marini's Produce, um, Produce Junction all year round, people mm -hmm. will go to. Um, it's an event too, it's an outing, especially with kids. And, and at Whole Foods, you can have a beer, yeah. you can have a <laughs> <That's always nice. laughs> gourmet coffee. <laughs> um, the prepared food section is huge, so you can have mm -hmm. lunch. Um, have your craft beer and then go shopping. So how are the conventional markets handling this? Because clearly if people are getting some of these particular items at other upscale supermarkets or the farmers markets, that money is not going to the conventional supermarkets. You're seeing more organic, you're seeing more foods, uh, gluten-free foods. Mm -hmm. ShopRite, um, owned by the Kenny family mm -hmm. in Newcastle County, has always been quick to spot the trends as far as gluten-free, as far as, as far as organic, and now prepared foods. They have a very large prepared food mm -hmm. section in their revamped brand new wine store. Yeah, Giant I know has two aisles dedicated to gluten-free, organic, and so they're sort of kind of jumping on the bandwagon too. Yeah, and they realize people want to come in and maybe uh, get their gluten-free bread, but also get sushi or get um, a, a roast beef that's already prepared or prepared ready for the oven. Uh, so they can take it home to the kids. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the already prepared <laughs> food. <laughs> All right, well, time's up. Thank you so much, Pam George. Her You're story welcome. is in the November issue of Delaware Today. The December issue is on newsstands now. Delaware Today is a content partner with us here on First.
The blood bank of Delmarva is looking to keep people flowing through its donor locations to collect blood. During this time of year, the call goes out for donors to come forward and make sure there is enough blood to meet the daily goals throughout Delaware and the entire region. Please keep in mind that there are patients in our communities that need blood every single day. It's not unusual to see empty seats at the Blood Bank of Delmarva during summer months, but this year the numbers are at an all-time low and the need to donate is critical. Right now our daily need is about 260 donors per day. CEO Roy Roper says the blood bank isn't coming close to that number and the empty shelves here is evidence that the blood supply is a problem. When people don't come in to donate, that creates a challenge because now we have to, to make up for those units. And so whether donors uh, come in today or tomorrow, the need by the hospitals never changes. The trend is also being seen nationally with all types of blood needed. Tom Keene, a 40-year member of the blood bank, donates platelets, which are often needed by cancer patients. Yeah, you wonder why there's not many in here. Uh, sometimes I'll come midweek and there'll be more seats filled. Uh, but platelets usually takes a couple hours, so I think people might be reluctant to give up that amount of time. Keen is among the 10% of the U.S. population eligible to donate blood, and he's dedicated for a special reason. Well, I donate platelets now every two to three weeks uh, because I know platelets are used a lot at the AI DuPont Institute. And there's a lot of children that need platelets. Besides platelets, which have a very short shelf life, Roper describes what blood types are needed most in trauma centers. According to officials, the summer is the busiest time of the year for trauma centers and hospitals. We also need type O and type B. Specifically for type O, we need O negative. O negative is the universal uh, donor type. And so in a trauma, for example, an O negative unit can be transferred into another, to a patient with another blood type. So it's a critical uh, blood type to have. Statistics indicate one in seven people may need a blood transfusion at least once in their lifetime. That's another reason officials are calling on people now to donate. And the hope is to keep people doing so throughout the year to make sure there's never a shortage. Meanwhile, as for Keen, the experience of giving blood will certainly bring you one thing. Well, you get that feeling of that uh, knowing you're helping someone and it doesn't really cost you anything except some time and some of your blood and platelets. The Blood Bank of Delmarva covers the three counties in Delaware, the Maryland counties on the Eastern Shore and Northern Virginia. But it's not that difficult to find any location near you in Pennsylvania and New Jersey as well. For more information or to schedule an appointment, visit delmarvablood.org. Stained glass, watercolor painting, photography, Dagsboro artist Jeffrey Todd Moore does a little bit of everything. A draftsman by trade, he was stuck in a rut watching TV after work, but a special calendar changed all that. We visited Jeffrey's home studio to hear his story and see his work. I started doing art because I was coming home from work, finding that I had spent all day sitting in front of a computer, and then I was coming home and watching television, and I said I have to break this cycle. So I bought an origami day calendar. Every night I would sit down and do a piece of origami, and I got very sort of into it. And then the next year, I decided to pick up a watercolor a day calendar. I took a watercolor workshop, and then I just started painting every night. From there, it just continued. I make my living as a draftsman. I work for a soil scientist and he goes out and collects samples to tell you where you can put your septic in a, on your lot. I do the drawings that get submitted to the county and the state. I started using the, the computer to sort of inform my watercolors. Um, I wanted not to just paint what I saw, I wanted to sort of press them into other places and eventually said, why am I painting these? These are kind of cool. 
that's when I started printing and selling my photography. I don't know why I started doing glass. Uh, my photography and my painting started to do a lot of geometric shapes. I don't know if I thought that would lend itself to glass. I'd always been fascinated with glass. And there was a glass shop across from one of the art leagues that I am involved with and I just walked in there. So my thoughts were, hey, that's the direction I'd like to go. So I took a couple of classes there. I do stained glass. I do glass mosaics, glass on glass mosaics. I'm starting to get into wire wrapping pendants. I think the reason I go from one thing to the next is I get bored quickly. I just keep looking for ways to change this and do this differently. I do it because I think that it's a great way to wash the day away. As soon as I started painting, it was all about the painting. It was no longer about the day. It's like a zen sort of feeling. This is for me, and hopefully someone will like it and buy it and appreciate it. I think that's what keeps me going. It's always astounding <laughs> that something that you did touches somebody enough that they were, they're going to fork out money for it. But I'm always just sort of shocked that someone wants to buy something that I created, to be perfectly honest with you. It's a very exciting, nice feeling. I know that my work is all across the states. I know that it's overseas. Um, and that's exciting. That's kind of cool. I hope when they see my stained glass and the lights coming through and the sun's coming through and it's bright and shiny, that it's just brightening their day. I hope they look at it and it makes them happy. I want it to bring color into their world. Over the Thanksgiving weekend, Jeffrey took part in the 22nd annual Southeastern Delaware Artist Studio Tour. The artists opened up their studios for tours and raised more than $3,000 for local school arts programs. You can get more information on his work and appearances when you visit him on the web at jeffreytoddmore.com. And next week on First, we're going to present a segment from our recent Veterans Coming Home series. It deals with veteran employment. There are programs out there looking to give jobs to those returning from their time in the military. However, those first jobs may not always be the perfect fit. Join us for those stories and more next time. That is first for this week. We thank you for watching. For Shirley Min and Mark Eichmann, I'm Michelle Polston. For everyone here on First, have a great week.